lot going on. It's so exciting. There's a lot of exciting things going on here at Hope, and, and I am just thrilled to be able to, to share with you guys today. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you ever get the feeling in life sometimes that, that somebody's holding out on you, that you're not experiencing the, the full experience of life? Let me, let me explain what I mean. Um, kids are a perfect example of this. And my wife, Cindy, and me, uh, we, we try to do a pretty good job of providing a healthy environment for our kids to grow up in. And uh, we're, we, we make sure they're eating enough vegetables. We make sure that they get enough exercise. But one area that we're starting to struggle with, I don't know if you experienced this, parents, is with all the sugary drinks out there for our kids. Do, do you experience that, parents? Um, and, and we're pretty proud of the fact that up until my son was about five years old, he had never once had his own soda. That, that's, that's a pretty astounding feat today. Um, but I'll never forget the day that that changed. My son and I were traveling. We're, we're visiting up uh, some, some family in New York. And we're out at a park. And it was a hot summer day. And I hear, Daddy, Daddy, I'm thirsty in his path- pathetic little voice. Um, and I said, okay, uh, good, good news, son. In fact, hey, right over there, there's a drink machine. And he'll take this dollar, and what I want you to do is go over there to the drink machine and put it in. And you see that, that blue button there at the bottom? Go ahead and push that button uh, and get yourself a water. And he says, okay, yes, sir. Um, now, this is, this is my son's first solo mission to the drink machine. And, and something happens between the moment when he says, yes, sir, those two words, and his 10-step walk over that drink machine. He, he gets this thought. This thought pops into my son's head. He thinks, um, I think my daddy's holding out on me. <laughs> I think he's holding out on me. Look, look at all these delicious flavors I could choose from. I've never experienced these. And so uh, let me just show you a picture of what I see next. There's my son, so obedient, <laughs> drinking his first soda right there. And then uh, show the next one. He's like, he's like, what? You, you got a problem, huh? <laughs> and then he knows he's in trouble, so he, he starts to flash that charm a little bit and And then there's that irresistible smile that he knows will will win everybody over. Um, And it's not just sodas. It's not just sugary drinks. Another example uh, is is with movie time. We we love movie night at the Lanuti household. And uh, something uh, that I've noticed lately as we've been doing movie night um, is when I get the kids together, I say, hey, what do you guys want to watch tonight? And lately, I'm starting to hear things like, ooh, We've never watched Godfather before. Let's watch that. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. We are not watching Godfather. And, uh, uh, don't even think about touching Die Hard. We are not watching Die Hard today. Just kidding. We don't actually own Die Hard. I just thought that would be a funny example. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the truth is this. It, it's not just kids who struggle with this. Uh, we do it all the time. Uh, you see, we, we do this with God. We believe the lie that God is holding out on us. Uh, and, and we're guilty of chasing after some things that we have no business chasing after. And some of you here today are, are dealing with that. Some of you have been deeply impacted by this over time. And some of you may not even know that you're doing it. Um, but today we're going to be looking at a character from long ago. We're going to be looking at the life of Adam. And, and actually he experienced this very same thing. So if you have a Bible today, uh, open up to Genesis Chapter 3, it shouldn't be too hard to find. Genesis is the very first book of the Bible. Um, And as you turn there, I want to point out what you're going to find is so astonishing today. That even though this text is so ancient, that it's actually completely relevant today. Uh, That you and I are actually just like Adam and we have a lot to learn. Uh, Let me set the the scene. Let me give you a little background information. We're going to pick up the story right after God finished creating everything. Right after he speaks and all of creation comes into existence. Out of nothing, out of chaos, God just speaks some words and boom, we have We have the universe, and then God creates the world, and then God creates a paradise. He creates this garden, and he forms Adam. He breathes life into him, and then that's not it. He gives Adam some some responsibility, some jobs that he loves doing so he never gets bored, so he can show off his skill and his knowledge, Um, and, and, and if that's not enough, he then gives him a naked woman to be with him as his wife. I'm not making it up. Uh, in fact, he even commands them to be fruitful and multiply. Pretty awesome. Just saying, you need to check it out. And before we get to chapter 3, also in chapter 2, I want to point you to one more thing. Uh, maybe you've missed it. But do you know what the first three words God ever spoke to Adam were? You ever, you ever, that's a pretty good trivia question. Do you know what they, what they were? The first three words were, you are free. 
not thou shalt not. The first three words God spoke to man were, you are free. And I love the next two words as well. Get this. You are free to eat. Those are the first five words God speaks to, to, to a man. Isn't that incredible? I love it. So there's Adam. He's in paradise. He, he's, he's living it up. He's got some jobs he loves doing. He's uh, got this bottomless buffet in front of him that he can eat at any time. And then on top of that, he's got his wife who's just walking around naked all the time. I'm just saying, those are pretty sweet conditions for Adam, aren't they? <laughs> Somebody's clapping back there. Uh, <laughs> And, and so uh, Adam, he's never bored. And with all this freedom, with, with this unbelievable freedom, God just gives him one rule. Just one rule. Not, not ten commandments, one rule. It says in chapter uh, 2, verse 17, he says, Just don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or you'll die. That's it. Just one rule. And it's not subjective. It, it's not like, uh, hey, Hey, try, try to be respectful. It, it, it's, it's not ambiguous. It's not like, uh, do your best. No, it's black and white. It's, hey, Adam, hey, hey, look right over there. Okay, you see that tree? Yeah, yeah, that one. That one right there. Yeah, yeah, okay, you got it? Good. Don't eat the fruit from that tree. Uh, if you do, you're going to die. Uh, but hey, everything else, everything else I've given you, it, it's all for you, Adam. I love you. Have at it. It's hard to fathom a world like this, isn't it? What if, what if I tried this someday? Let's say the babysitter comes over and I'm like, okay, babysitter, come on down. Uh, kids, let's gather around. Everybody make sure you got your listening ears on. I'm going to explain the one rule for tonight. Everybody, listen up close. You're not going to want to miss this. Okay, yeah, I put a bowl of fruit on top of the fridge. The one rule, you guys got it? Uh, make sure you don't eat that fruit. It's actually poisonous, and if you eat it, you're going to die. Hey, but anything else, you want to run with scissors, you want to play with fire, you want to watch Die Hard, have at it. I love you guys. Peace out. I'll be back at 11. No, that, we don't live in that world, and, and I, I'm not trying to say that Adam actually uh, ran around with scissors or, or watched Die Hard. That, that's ridiculous. But I'm just trying to, to paint the picture to give you guys an illustration of the unbelievable love and the unbelievable freedom that they enjoyed from a loving father. But unfortunately, we're going to see that Adam and his wife Eve are able to obey about as long as a five-year-old holding a dollar unsupervised in front of a drink machine. Um, so that's where we're going to pick it up in, in chapter 3. Uh, we're going to meet uh, a serpent Satan himself, the master of lies, the master of deceit. I'm starting right there at the beginning uh, of chapter 3. Listen to what Satan says to Eve. He says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve answers. And by the way, Eve should have never responded. She should have just ignored this question. She should have known it was a trap from the onset. But she responds. And, and let it be known, actually, if a snake slithers up into the, into the Lanuti yard, um, it's shovel time. That thing is a goner. I'm just saying. Um, but Eve responds, and, and even though she shouldn't have, she says this in verse 2. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Okay, so far so good for Eve. She's clearly memorized the one rule she had to remember, right? The one rule, and she's reciting it. But notice she actually, out of fear, even adds to it. She even adds the part about, oh, we can't even touch it now. But before we go and we give Eve a gold star, uh, this is where it all starts to fall apart. Listen to what Satan, the serpent, says next. He says, you will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, Satan is using the same deception that, that my son faced. Hey, that you're missing out on something. Um, that your God is, your, your father, he's holding out on you. Um, and, and he's almost like he's saying, you guys just frolic around all day. You don't even know what's going on. Don't you want to see what you're missing? It's right there. It, it's right here. Come on, just, just take a nibble and find out what you're missing. And so um, it says this. When, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some 
and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So notice this. Where's our boy Adam this whole time? Where is he? he he's right next to her, just completely silent, doing nothing, uh, motionless, no acting, just, just standing by, witnessing this all unfold. Um, and then this is one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible. It says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. See, Adam and Eve believed the lie that God was holding out on them. Um, they, and, and look how they feel. They feel ashamed. And, and then look what they do. It says they go and they hide. As soon as they heard God coming, they run and they hide. It's so sad. With this one act of disobedience, every level of relationship is immediately thrown into chaos. Their relationship with God, their relationship with each other, their relationship with the world around them, all immediately with this one act of disobedience, it, it's just thrown out of whack. It's severed. It's fractured. It's broken. And they're left scared and they're ashamed and they're hiding from God, hopelessly trying to cover up with some homemade fig leaf underwear. That, that's literally what they're trying to do. Um, and listen to this exchange between God and these two rookie sinners, and don't miss this. God is pursuing them, even right now. We're going to unpack that thought a little bit more later. But notice that throughout the story, we see that God is the one pursuing us. God says, where are you? And, and Adam answers, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And then God responds, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten the, from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And then look at Adam's response. It's awesome. He says in Genesis 3, 12, yes, Father, I confess it's all my fault. I stood here and did nothing to stop it from happening. My bad. Please keep my wife out of this. I accept full responsibility. That's actually not what he said at all. I just made that up. <laughs> um, and, and you need to bring a Bible here because uh, we could be putting anything up on the side screens. Um, <laughs> I actually just made that up. He says, uh, in, uh, he actually says, the woman, the woman who you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. In other words, Adam's like, listen, God, you don't have to talk to me. I was just out minding my own business, pruning the begonias in the garden. I got a little hot, got a little hungry, so I came back to that naked woman you gave me, and she gave me some fruit. It's not my fault. She does the cooking. Talk to her. He, that's, that's his attitude. See, even right now, he's hiding, and he's pointing the finger of blame at someone else. He doesn't want to take any responsibility for his own actions. This, this reminds me of my daughter. She's six. Uh, Joelle, she's as sweet as can be. But when she has done something wrong, she doesn't want anybody to look at her. She'll, she'll even kind of cover her face sometimes. Um, and when she's done something really wrong, she, I don't even have to say anything. She just goes and she runs to her room and she hides and closes the door. Um, and, and she'll lock it. And as I go up to, to talk to her and, and knock on the door, I say, hey, hey, sweetie, can we talk? And every time she'll say something like, it's my brother's fault. He's being mean to me. He made me do it. See, she's just like Adam. She runs and she hides, and then she points the finger of blame at someone else. So the attention now turns from, from Adam. He points the finger at, at Eve. So now Eve is kind of in the hot seat here. And look what she does. She does the exact same thing. In, in verse 13, she says, no, no, no. It's the serpent. The serpent did it to me. It's his fault. See, both are disobeying. The truth is they're both trying to hide in their ridiculous fig leaf underwear. But listen to this truth. Don't miss this. There is nowhere you can hide from the relentless pursuit of God's love. Let me say it again. There is nowhere you can hide from the relentless pursuit of God's love. As we look at the story, we see that the very first thing God does after these two sinners disobey, the very first thing is God takes action. It's God who's pursuing them. It's God who's out looking for them. God who's chasing after them because of his incredible love for his children. Because he's designed us to be in a relationship with them. And, and, and he's never content. He's never satisfied when that relationship is severed. And he's relentless in pursuing us. He won't stop. And there's nowhere we can hide. Although we, we try to anyway, don't we? 
Um, and I can't take you to this passage and not show you what happens. Remember, uh, Adam is in the hot spot. He, uh, he kind of passes the blame onto Eve, and then Eve passes the blame onto the serpent. And then there's this awesome moment where, where God and the serpent have this little spat. God against Satan. It's, oh, it's so great. Can't wait to show you. Uh, look at verse 15. I'm going to paraphrase it. I probably shouldn't paraphrase your words, God. I apologize. But this is basically what God says. He says, Satan, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, you think you're pretty tough, don't you? Hey, well, just so you know, one is coming. In fact, one of Eve's own descendants, and here he's referencing, it's the very first reference in the Bible to Jesus Christ. He says, just so you know, there's one coming who is going to crush your head. Oh, isn't that awesome? So incredible. And perhaps the, the most ancient prophecy in all the Bible that Jesus Christ himself will come and he will triumph over evil. He will triumph over Satan and all his schemes. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen that moment in the garden where God's calling him out? And you can just almost picture the, the serpent getting small and, and curling up in fear. God's like, hey, Satan, yeah, just so we're clear, I'm going to crush you for this. Oh, it's so awesome. But if that's not a good enough indication of how we see God pursue us in our life, how we see God spring into action, look at verse 21. It says this, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Notice again, it's, it's God who's doing the action. It's God who's doing the pursuing. It's God who's covering them. But let me ask you a question. What, what does God use to make these clothes? Go ahead, shout it out. I'm a teacher. You can shout out things at me. What does he use? Skin, skin, that's right. So he had to kill something innocent in order to cover their sin, in order to cover their shame. God had to sacrifice something innocent. Do you know what this is? This is a clear foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, how one day God will send Jesus Christ, his very own son, as a perfect sacrifice to once and for all uh, cover our sin in our shame. Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus Christ is specifically referenced right in the very first book of the Bible? It's awesome. I'm not making this up. Paul actually agrees with me. Uh, in the book of Romans, chapter 5, uh, and really you should check out the whole chapter, but I'm just going to take you to one verse. Paul says in verse 17, uh, For if by the trespass of the one man, that's Adam, if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ? See, God is never content to leave us hiding in sin and shame. God pursues us. We see it throughout the whole narrative of Scripture. And it culminates in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus suffered and died on a cross that you and I deserved. He voluntarily took our place so that we could once again have a relationship with his Father. And when he rose from the dead, when, when he rose from the dead, he crushed the head of Satan once and for all. So that we could experience eternal life in heaven with our Father. And not just that, guys. So that we could experience life to the full here on earth. Is that not incredible? I think, that, I think that's worth clapping for. I don't know, but, you know, he, he did that. <laughs> and that's not even the best part. The best part of it is this, that we can't earn it. We can't deserve it. There's nothing we can do. It's because God pursues us. He's the one doing the action, not us. And, and, and some of you, you need to hear that today. That's, that might be the only thing you need to hear, that there is nowhere you can hide from the relentless pursuit of God's love. If... If you're hearing that for the first time today, I, I would love to meet you because you need to know that there is a God out there who is crazy about you, um, that he desires a relationship with you, that he's pursuing you right now. Today we're celebrating baptisms, and I, I love baptisms at Hope. It's one of my favorite things we do. It, it's a celebration of how God pursues his children and, and how God uh, has started, how he has initiated a relationship with some people who have recognized they were hiding it's another example of how God crushes the head of Satan. You guys got to come with us. We're going to be doing it right after service. Just follow us right outside. It's a celebration, guys. It's a time to party. But for all of us here today, whether you're a Christ follower or not, God wants to ask you a question. God wants to ask you the same question he asked Adam. Where are you? Where are you? Are, are you hiding again? 
See, we're all like Adam, every one of us here today. We, we all believe the lie that God is holding out on us. And, and from time to time, we all try to take things into our own hands. Maybe today you believe the lie that, that God is withholding pleasure from you. And, and even though you know that it never lasts, you seek pleasure in lust and you indulge in that. Um, maybe you watch things on the internet you shouldn't look at. Maybe you watch things on TV you shouldn't look at. Maybe you're crossing the line sexually with someone you're not married to. Or maybe you believe the lie that it's okay to look but not touch. And women, I'm speaking to you too. Um, may, maybe, maybe you're reading some sketchy books that paint a picture of a marriage that you secretly desire. And time after time again, you find that that satisfaction doesn't last. And you're left in this predictable pattern of sin and guilt and shame. And sin and guilt and shame. And sin, guilt, shame. Um, and you're hiding. And we're all good at trying to cover up our sin, aren't we? But let me tell you today, that is just fig leaves. God says, where are you? Let me be the one to cover your sin. Look at what, what Jesus says to the woman at the well in John 4, 13. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. In other words, whoever's looking for pleasure elsewhere, whoever's looking anywhere besides me for joy, it's never going to last. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. God's asking, how long are you going to keep hiding? How long are you going to keep settling for something else? I'm right here. I'm not withholding anything from you. And maybe today you struggle with something different. Maybe, maybe you struggle with a need for control. Um, and and I, as a pastor, I get to do a lot of counseling, and this one comes up a lot. I, I hear this all the time, these words, it's, it's not fair, Dave. It's just not fair. I, I'm losing control. My circumstances have gone crazy. It's not fair. I need control. Well, maybe that's you today. Maybe you're dealing with some unfortunate circumstances. Maybe there's an illness in your family. Maybe your spouse has left you. Or maybe your, your child, your daughter, your son has gone prodigal. Or maybe you've lost your job, and like Adam, uh, you're left pointing the blame. You're, you're left pointing the finger at somebody else, at your circumstances, or at somebody, and you don't want to take responsibility for your own actions. And you're frustrated with God, and you think, maybe, uh, maybe he's holding out on you. So what you try to do is you try to take things into your own hands. And let me tell you, this is just my observation. When you do that, it, it just goes from bad to worse every time. But hear me out. If that's you today, I have good news. That is not a deal breaker for God. It's just fig leaves. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to hide. God's calling you by name. Where are you? And sometimes in life for a lot of Christ followers, the lies of Satan uh, can be a little more subtle. Uh, but they can be is equally dangerous. Sometimes the lies of Satan, when we believe that, that he is is not in control, um, we, we find ourselves in a place altogether that we shouldn't be, and, and we're missing out on the blessing and calling of our life. Um, I had a where are you moment with God about three years ago. Let me share my story with you. Um, about three years ago, uh, on the heels of some unexpected, uh, potentially life-threatening news to me, and, and thank God I'm okay, but on the heels of that, I started feeling the call to go into full-time ministry. It's about three years ago. And I, I never once heard uh, an audible voice from God. I never once, you know, he never spelled anything in my Cheerios or anything like that. Um, I just felt this growing discontent in my career here as, as a teacher. Um, I used to teach right here at the high school. Um, and... And, and the more that I got plugged in and serving and helping hurting people, the more that this, this calling kept coming louder and louder. I kept feeling that, that God was calling me to something more. And about a year ago, it reached a fever pitch. I could no longer ignore it. And I remember sitting with my small group uh, up in my living room, and, and we're sharing prayer requests. And by the way, if you're not in a small group, you're missing out. I love my small group. I can't imagine life without them. Um, and so we're, we're, we're taking prayer requests, and, and, and it comes to me, and I, say, I share what's on my heart. I tell them, guys, after 11 years of teaching, I'm thinking about leaving the profession. Um, and, and by the way, this was before leaving the teaching profession was the cool thing to do. I, I like to think that I kind of started a trend. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but anyway, I share with them that, that I'm thinking about leaving teaching and entering full-time ministry. 
and I'll never forget how they prayed for me that night. Um, they, they prayed specifically that, that God would close some doors that needed to be closed and that God would open some doors that needed to be opened. Um, and, and, and just as God would have it, this is, this is a true story. I go uh, right here into, into work the next day. I open up my computer, and there's an email from my principal. And this is the kind of email you don't want to get. It's real short. It's a one-liner. It says, Mr. Lanuti, stop by my office before you leave today. Dun, dun, dun. One of those kind of emails. Um, and, and all day I'm thinking, you ever get one of those where you're like, oh, what did I do? I know I'm in trouble. What am I going to do? And so I go in to talk with the principal, and he sits me down. He says, Mr. Lanuti, it's not based on anything you've done. In fact, you're kind of doing a good job here. But um, I got some bad news for you. We, we actually don't have funding for a full-time position for you next year. You're going to need to go find a new job. The, the very next day. This, this, is, this is what happened. Um, you know what my first reaction was? My first reaction was to laugh. I thought, God, you're hilarious. I'm sure the principal thought I was crazy. Uh, I, I said, God, you're hilarious. You're really going to close the door on teaching the day after my small group prays for this? Okay, all right. If that's what you're doing, I'm in, God. I, I'm in. Let's do this thing. And I left the office feeling excited, almost exhilarated uh, of this news. I called my wife, and then the very next person I called was Pastor Chris. And, and I said, hey, Chris, good news. And listen, I, I honestly believed that he would just have this job waiting for me, that he could just give to me. That's, that's what I was thinking. Like, hey, Chris, good news. I lost my job. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's good news. Uh, so, hey, let's talk about maybe getting me a job at Hope. Do you have a job for me? And, and you know how awesome God is, right? But, but here's what Chris says. He says, uh, no, Dave. Um, <laughs> I, I actually don't have a job for you. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, and I remember thinking this, uh, doubt started creeping in. I remember thinking, um, hey, God, you, you do remember this was like a two-part prayer, right? <laughs> um, you got the first part down. That was great. Great. Yeah, you closed the doors. Good job, God. Way to go. Uh, but there's actually this second part that's pretty crucial here, uh, opening the doors to full-time ministry. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 and he he, he didn't. He, he didn't open those doors to full-time ministry. But um, uh, I'm getting excited. I lost my place here. Um, I, I, I started r running. And I started hiding. Um, and, and then this is when the evil one, uh, the serpent, slithers into my story. And, and here's what he said to me. And, and I believed his lies. Um, well, first he says, hey, Dave. Did, did God really call you into full-time ministry? Did, did you actually hear him say that? I thought, well, you know, that's a good question. But see, the evil one wasn't done. He kept lying to me, and I kept believing him. And he said this. He said, Dave, you're not good enough for full-time ministry. And then he said, hey, Dave, you're too big of a sinner for full-time ministry. And then this one was the absolute worst because it's wrong on just so many levels. He said, Dave, you know Chris Cochran. And, and I ran and I hid um, and I tried to take things in my own hands. And I didn't have to run very far. In fact, I just went right next door to the middle school, uh, to Holly Grove Middle, and I found a job within two weeks. I had landed a job there as, as a PE teacher. I'd never taught PE in my life. And Principal Prue, if you're here, love you, man. Thanks for giving me that job. Um, but you got to hear this story. So I go and I get this job, and I'm pretending like I'm really excited. I remember Chris calling me up, and he took me out to lunch. And, and I remember we're sitting there at Chick-fil-A, and, and he says, hey, just the look on his face, he didn't have to say a thing at all. The look of disbelief, the look of shock when I had told him I had so quickly given up on full-time ministry. And then later uh, that week, there were some friends, some teachers from the new school, they were having a cookout, and, and they invited me. Uh, and they, in fact, they even baked me a cake in my honor in the shape of the mascot of uh, the logo of the school over there. It's, it's incredible. Everybody's hugging me, congratulating me. Dave, you're the best. This is going to be great. It's going to be so great to work with you. And inside, I'm thinking, no, I'm not. I'm a loser. I, I am running the wrong way. I'm actually hiding right now. I'm ashamed, and I'm trying to cover up. And I couldn't take it. And so I went home, and I confessed it as sin to God. And, and you know what this loving father did, uh, this loving heavenly father? He didn't punish me. He didn't shame me. He picked me back up. He dusted me off, and he told me, he said, Dave, um, you know what? Here's the truth. You're actually not good enough for ministry. Um, but, but you're with me. You're with me, Dave. 
and we can do this together. In fact, he told me that he's made strong in my weakness. And, and just about a week later, my phone rings. And it's Jason Gore. He's the director of small groups at, at Hope Community Church. I haven't spoken to this guy in years since college. And, and he calls me up out of the blue and he says, hey, Dave, how's it going? Oh, great, Jason. Uh, he says, hey, I'd love to have lunch with you sometime to talk about small groups and the future of where we're going at Hope. Awesome, Jason. Yes, I'm in. I love small groups. I'd love to talk about that. So we go out to lunch, and there at lunch, he, he tells me about this position of area pastor. And then it was just a few days later, he offered me the job. Um, and, and that's my story, but I, I want to share with you that what's so amazing is that God continues to pursue us. There's nowhere we can hide from the relentless pursuit of his love. And I have some action steps for you, but if you would, would you bow your heads with me? As we close, I, I just want to make sure you're not distracted. Um, i got some questions for you and some things you need to take care of with God. God wants to ask you this question today. Where are you? Are you where you should be? I don't, I don't know what you're dealing with today, and only knew, you know where you're hiding, but would you admit it today? Would you admit that you're hiding? And would you be willing to take the next step? For some of you, if you've decided to stop hiding from God altogether and you've begun a relationship with him, your next step is being baptized. It's time to go public with your faith. And for some of you who are already Christ followers, your next step is to stop hiding behind your busy schedule and to recommit to spending some time alone with God. And for others, your next step is to stop hiding out alone in your Christian life. You need to experience the true community of small groups. And maybe for some of you here, it's time to stop hiding in that unhealthy relationship. It's, it might be time to call it off. Or maybe like me, it's time to recognize that, that you've been hiding way too long from God's true calling and his blessings in your life. And, and maybe it's time to change careers. But for all of us, no matter what we're dealing with when you walk through the doors this morning, we need to stop settling for fig leaves. We need to stop believing the lie that God is holding out on us. We need to stop looking anywhere else except the one who relentlessly pursues us with his love. Would you take that next step in trusting him today? Father, we confess to you that, that we are hiding, um, that, that we try to cover our sin and shame with fig leaves. But Father, thank you so much that you sent your son to die for us, that you were never content to leave us there, that you are chasing after us, you are pursuing us even right now, and that we can have a relationship with you. God, would you give us... Uh, the strength, would you give us the courage to take the next step in believing that you're not holding out on us, that what you have for us is good and is true. Um, would you help us take that next step? We love you, and we pray in your name. Amen.